That is the Sonoramic Commando, right? What a name, right? That was Plymouth Division's name for the new, for 1960, ram induction setup. So, I mean, I'm sure you guys have all seen pictures of this, right? But let me give you a quick evolution of it and how it works. So, before you can even get to this, you have to go back to World War II, right? Chrysler engineers at the time, they were a young bunch, gearheads, and they had a, a lot of resources at their disposal to develop, you know, systems for planes, tanks, and whatnot. And once the war was over, they were anxious to get this stuff into the automotive pipeline. So, the things that we take for granted today, like hemispheric or combustion chambers, and electronic, electronic fuel injection, and we actually did a video on that, and Uncle Katia put a link to it over here, uh, the Chrysler Electrojector cars in 1958. But things like that and ram induction are stuff that we take for granted today. Chrysler engineers are actually working 30, 40 years ahead of the, 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 the curve. You know, you open the hood of anything today, and there's a tuned runner intake manifold. Well, this was the first production application of that. So before we can even actually talk about that, we have to talk about this. This was a, a, a car called the High and Mighty. This was actually, uh, it was owned by a group of Chrysler engineers. And what they were doing was they were drag testing all of these different concepts that they were going to put into production later on. And what you see here is the prototype, the very first tunnel ram intake manifold. Now they weren't out to design a tunnel ram intake manifold. What they were doing was they were testing individual runners, uh, the tuned length runners. And you can see these things are made out of ready to hose. You know, they clamp at the top and the bottom. And uh, they were doing this so that they could raise and lower it, try different lengths, different diameters, and, and get the, the, the tune just right. So what they learned from this, they employed in this. So actually, here's a, here's a good underhood shot. This is what it looked like uh, when it was produced. So this setup, this long ramp setup, was available across the board in anything. Dodge, Plymouth, Chrysler, uh, from 1960 and 1961. 361, 383, 413 were all available with the ram induction package. So let me explain how this thing works. All right. Uh, let's see. Here's a good picture of work. All right. So. Originally, as this thing was originally produced in 1960, what they were looking for was a, a, a package, something that would that would give a lot of slam, right, passing gear. You know, so when you hit this thing at 30 or 40 miles an hour, you really lay it back on the seat. And that's exactly what this did. What they found was that at 30 inches of, of runner length, and that includes right up to the intake manifold, or intake valve rather. So from the intake valve to the plenum, is 30 inches. And this 30 inch runner sonic tunes at t beginning at 2800 RPM. So basically what that means is uh, at 2800 RPM, the time that it takes for the, when the intake valve closes, there's a, 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 a pulse begins. And that pulse resonates back through the intake manifold, hits the plenum, turns around, and helps push the charge in for the next cycle. So at this length, from 30 inches from the intake manifold to the plenum, it tunes at beginning at 2800 RPM. If you've ever driven one of these things, uh, it, it's, it's, it's actually, it'll blow your mind. You know, you hit it, you know, you're driving a 5,000 pound car, you hit it at, you know, 3,000 RPM, and it just lays you back in the seat. The problem with this setup, though, is that it's all used up by about 4,500 RPM. So the first two years of production, it was offered in this package, and you know it wasn't it wasn't so totally out of out of line either because the interstate highway system was really just coming into its own, and most traffic at that time still moved on back roads at 50, 40, 50 miles an hour. So this thing was very viable. They did offer a shorter runner intake manifold as an option, as an option, as as a, 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 a over the counter package for guys who are racing like uh, Bonneville uh, top end racers where the, the runners were split. So instead of them div being divided the whole way down, let's look at this picture here. Okay, so here's the setup from 1960 and 61, and you can see that the runners are divided the complete length from the head to the, plen to the, uh, to the manifold, to the plenum. On this setup, this is originally from 1960, they cast about 15 sets of these things for, for 
guys that were looking to tune at a higher RPM. And then when they re-released this in 1963, uh, in 1964, for the Chrysler letter cars, the J&K letter cars, this is the manifold that they used. And while this one tunes at about 2800 RPM, this one starts tuning at about 4500 RPM. So this will take you from about 4500 to around 6000 RPM. So, Again, this is the early setup, 1960, 1961, and this is the later setup, 1963, 1964. There's debate as to whether, whether either of these setups were available in 1962. But as far as I know, the 62 cars only came with inline dual quads. So on the downside of this, you had the, uh, the, this is the exhaust system from it. You see beautiful cast iron headers. Uh, they're, they're basically, um, if you look at the Max Wedge cars from 1962, uh, here, here's a Max Wedge. 62, they downsized the cars, so they weren't able to go down with the manifolds, so they came up like this. But we're going to get to the Max Wedge in a minute. So, this setup right here uh, did the trick for the 1961-61 cars. In 62, they introduced the Max Wedge. All right, so this is the 413, and this was a drag package. And you can see this was supposed to operate from around, from around 5,500, 6,000 RPM to 7,000. And you can see how much closer the carburetors are to each other. When they went to the next phase in 1964 with the race heavy, they moved the carburetors even closer together and shortened the runners even more. And that's because this was supposed to tune from around 6,500 to around 7,500 RPM. So essentially, that's, that's the, this whole setup in a nutshell. The longer the runner, the lower the RPM it tunes at. The shorter the runner, the higher the RPM that it tunes at. So this was the 1964-1965 race Hemi setup. Uh, they did bring this back one more time in 1968 for the, uh, the super stock Hemi darts and barracudas. But for the most part, that was the end of the, the, the Chrysler Ram induction you know, era. Uh, they were they were elaborate. They were expensive to produce. They were easily screwed up by people who didn't understand what was going on. So naturally, you know, the single four barrel dual or conventional inline dual quads and later the six pack took over. And it, these systems didn't really become viable again until around the later 1980s, when they were really you know automakers across the board were really looking at like maximize efficiency. So they started repackaging things to get those longer runners and invariable length runners and so on and so forth. You know. But, uh, but that was it. You know, that's, people are like, you know, so why are you so enamored of like the Chrysler engineering of that era? Well, this is it, you know. These guys were like, they were ahead of their time. It was like, they're, you know, they were, they were a good solid 30 years ahead of their time. And, uh, you know, they pulled out all the stops. And that's, you know, that's what makes Mopar, made Mopar, Mopar. It was, it was these systems and that type of thought process. So, yeah, that's it. I'll see you tomorrow.